Hey, ¿qué pasa, Calexico? Welcome back to the podcast. Like always, before we begin, I want to thank a couple of people. I want to thank all my sponsors. I want to thank my friends Camilo, Jake, Eddie Lopez from Roots Creative, Ms. Norma Sierra Galindo, Sergio's Tacos and Hot Dogs, serving the Imperial San Diego and Yuma counties with eight years of experience with Mexicali style hot dogs and taquizas. Uh, contact Sergio at 760-0057 or look for Sergio's Tacos and Hot Dogs on Facebook. I want to thank Eric Reyes from Los Amigos de la Comunidad, empowering communities together. And finally, I want to thank David Gastelum. If you're thinking of buying or selling a home in the Imperial or San Diego counties, make sure you contact David. He's not only a realtor, but an investor with over 20 years of experience. And he'll teach you along the way in one of the most important investments of your life. You can contact David at 760-235-9576 or look for David on Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff. Um, my guest today is a... Um, this this um this election of for district attorney is becoming something that i guess more and more people are, are hearing about because well we've had the same district attorney for like i want to say like 30 years close to 30 years so now we've 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 been hearing about it more because we've been getting more and more people running for it <clears throat> today my guest today is one of the candidates um, my guest today is mr jason amaviska thank you for being here today Thank you very much for the invitation, Mr. Alejo. It is an honor to be here on your podcast. Um, before we get into your campaign and you know all the your platform and everything, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. I was raised in San Pedro, California, and came to the Valley in 2000 to work as a deputy district attorney. I worked in the Valley actually from the for the district attorney's office from 2000 to 2006. Upon arriving at the Valley, I immediately knew that this was a, a place to raise a family, a very homey place, if you will. That may sound a little corny, but even today, you know, you can go to Walmart and nobody's fighting over a parking stall. Like when I go visit my family in L.A., you got to be careful if you're going to fight for that parking stall. Not here. It's a very congenial, family-oriented communi uh, community. Um, I studied in San Luis Rio, Colorado. I did a high school. My mother is a retired high school teacher from Sonora, and she wanted me to have the bicultural education, if you will. And as part of my high school, I was a mariachi for four years. My father was a professional uh, musician prior to going into the military. So he also instilled the arts, my mother, the education. And I became a lawyer at my father's uh, instruction when I was a child that, you know, the law makes a difference. It helps people. And that's something that he... Uh, geared me toward. And I've been um, blessed with having been uh, been able to help a lot of people uh, throughout my career. And as a prosecutor, I think I, I will do that even more as, as the DA. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you got here in 2000 and you worked for, uh, you mentioned, um, I was reading the article in by the Colexico Chronicle, where um, you were hired by our current um, district attorney. That is correct. <clears throat> Mr. Otero gave me the opportunity, first of all, to get to know the Valley and then also uh, professionally to grow uh, as a practitioner. Um, you also mentioned that if it w if if he would have re ran for re-election, you weren't so sure if you would run, you know, in the in this uh, election season. That is correct. I'm not certain that I would. My aspiration has been to be a prosecutor, but I, I also have a very success a successful practice uh, practicing criminal defense, federal and state. But the moment I, I heard that Mr. Otero was retiring, uh, considering the candidates, I felt that, and I continue to feel that, I, I am the best position to fill Mr. Otero's legacy and improve upon it, expand the work that he has done for this community. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've, I've worked for a lot of people and you, were, you work for Mr. Otero. And I mean, when you work for, for people, there's, even though you might have the best best boss in the world, there's a couple of things that you know, you might want to change. Um, what, would, what would be some of the things that you would, you know, or you feel need change with our with our current system? With the system, you're referring to the uh, district attorney's office yeah. administration? Okay. Yeah. Principally, making a strong relationship with the community. Obviously, we want to do it with law enforcement. This is the top cop, if you will, of the county is a district attorney's office. But just as important is to forge that relationship with the community, for the community to know there is a district attorney's office, there is a victim witness office. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't know 
uh, that what a district attorney is because a lot of people, you know, go to their jobs, they come home, they don't get into trouble. And district attorney, unfortunately, it's either because you're being accused of a crime and you see the complaint where it says district attorney against you, or unfortunately, you're a victim of a crime where you have victim witness reaching out to you. I want to make a strong relationship with the community so that they are aware that we are there to help. And that office is for the people, not only for victims, but also for the youths. Uh, how do we do that? We can accomplish that by going to debriefs once a month or twice every other month, et cetera. I know that our, the resources are, are lacking, but do the best what, that we can with what we have. So forge a relationship with law enforcement, with a community, go to schools and start from elementary school. You know, kids are, are sponges. They're very susceptible to what they see. You bring a police officer, an investigator, an attorney, you talk about, you talk about law and order, Go to school. You can achieve your dreams. It doesn't matter what your background is. You, you know, we are here to help you. Don't get into drugs. Don't get into trouble. And we will see that not only is that as a deterrent effect, but you strengthen our community and our economy. Yeah, and and that was one of my questions. Um, what in 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 your own own words and kind of like in layman's terms, what is a di district attorney's job for like for you? The district attorney is going to be the officer, the executive officer that's going to receive all of the police reports, whether they are from, for example, Calexico Police Department, Brawley Police Department, Imperial County Sheriffs. Once someone is arrested or cited for an offense, the investigation takes place from a law enforcement agency uh, position. They forward those reports to the district attorney's office. At that point, the district attorney or the and deputy district attorneys will review the reports and determine there's an array of options. One, there's either an insufficiency of evidence, the case could be rejected. It could be resubmitted. You know, there may be something here, but I need you to interview a percipient witness that wasn't interviewed, or it can be uh, approved. That's when the prosecution formally begins, when it is brought before the court, and then the accused is given notice to appear for court. So the top decision maker, whether someone is going to be facing criminal charges is the district attorney, even before it gets to the judicial system. That shows you the awesome power that this office holds. Yeah. Um, and district attorney um, elections aren't really popular when it comes to, you know, the community voting. Why do you think it's important for the community to get involved and, and get to know the people that are electing for this, this like you said, this very powerful position? You, you are correct in that really district attorney's offices, attorney generals, and when you go statewide, it's uh, appellate judges, state appellate judges. You see a, a number of them in the ballot. You really don't know who they are. It's not only until either you're accused of a crime or you're a victim when you are aware of this office. Now, why is it important now to know who your candidate is? First of all, let's identify as you so uh, aptly asked, what is a district attorney? It's someone that holds a lot of power. And you want to make sure that it's someone that is experienced. And that's why it's been years that there's not been a hot, or I anticipate there's going to be a very contested uh, election year uh, because we don't have a uh, uh, someone that is uh, in, um, I'm sorry, the word escapes me, in, in, uh, Mr. Otero retired, right? So there's like- An incumbent. Incumbent. Thank you very much. Yes, there's no incumbent. <clears throat> there's several candidates that are running for it. And I think that's going to bring a lot of attention to the public. And they're going to want to know what is the district attorney and who's qualified for it. So it's going to bring more attention, in my ha opinion. Have you ever ran for any other um, public office positions? I have not. No. I have not. Do you think that, um, you know, this is a public office position, like people vote for this position? Do you think it's... Uh, a plus or does it help you if you were you know if you had experience in that or is it just you know just knowing the law and, and you know knowing the position that really um, makes you a better candidate what makes me a better candidate is that i have over 20 years as an attorney not just a a general practice attorney a criminal practitioner for over 20 years and also an administrator as i pointed out in my in my uh, candidacy statement when I was with the DA's office, I contributed to the forming of the fraud unit, which was a brand new thing. 
I was in charge of writing the grants, of going to Sacramento. That's an administrative position that many other candidates are going to lack. Um, the DAs could be, it is a political position, obviously you're running for it, but it's really a management of the biggest law office of this county. I've had a practice for 20, 16 years, right? I've had employees. I've been able to uh, represent people, but I want to represent more than one person. I want to represent the state. And I think that this sets me apart from someone else that is a politician uh, for just policymaking. A district attorney not only has to know about policymaking, which I have the experience, but also the practice, the practice of law, forging the relationships with a court. And I know that I possess the, the, the experience and the knowledge to bring forward uh, the office of the district attorney successfully to the community. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your slogan, um, to serve the people? The right time, for the right, the right choice, the right time? Because this is the right time. There is no incumbent, as you pointed out. There are four, for now, there are four candidates. The voter has to examine who is going to serve me, my community, the best. And in my position, if you look at our the qualifications of each of us, the experience, I come in front of them with all due respect to my candidates because they are all attorneys, they are all very good attorneys, but I have the experience. Perhaps I'm dating myself, but I have the experience both as a prosecutor and as a defense attorney, as a business owner, and as an administrator when I was in the DA's office. Yeah. Um, I know one of the candidates, you know, has the kind of like the backing of the current DA. Um, do you think that that matters? Well, it doesn't hurt, obviously. <laughs> but once you talk about experience, it matters because experience matters. Someone that knows what a case is worth, whether we are going to use our limited resources to file charges, you need to know whether should this be a misdemeanor, should it be a felony, should it be diversion, should it be rejected, should it be accepted. Uh, the candidate that you're referring to has a huge, huge potential in the future when he earns the experience. I don't think that the experience is sufficient to represent the state and the county of California and manage the biggest law office that we have in this firm. Okay. In this county, excuse me. Yeah. Um, you said you you got here in uh, 2000. Um, what what have you learned from, you know, in the 20 some years that you've been here in the Valley? Um, what have you learned about, you know, the Imperial County, the community that, um, because uh, some of the people that are running, you know, have, you know, are Imperial Valley natives, they've, they grew up here. What what have you learned in those 20 years that, um, from the community that, you know, you could uh, apply to the office of, of the DA? Community bond. We are, you know, there's never, when someone is in need where the community will not gather to be together to help someone, whether there's a tragedy, whether... Um, you know, unfortunately, we see there, there, there's crime, there's, uh, there's people in the corner saying, help us, you know, we need someone for uh, certain services, etc. The community comes together. Um, and that is also uh, nurturing from my childhood. My family is very tight knit. My family is from Sonora, which is, you know, just like Baja California, it's a border town. Um, I have that in my culture. I, you know, and for me, this is my home. It's not that I'm not from Imperial. Imperial is my home. My children grew up here, uh, elementary, graduated high school, and this is where I want to live. I was blessed and fortunate that Mr. Otero gave me the opportunity to have uh, my job here. And unlike uh, individuals that will use the Imperial County's office as a stepping stone, I said, this is my home and I want to contribute to my home. And I think I am the when in the better position to do that than my candidates. Yeah. Um, I recently had the pleasure of talking to um, George Marquez, and I think you and him have both uh, um, brought uh, brought up the subject of, you know, we have a, a huge turnaround, turnout uh, when it comes to, you know, people serving in the uh, DA's office. Um, and you both mentioned that it's a, it's a, it's a problem and, and you, there's something that you would like to uh, fix. What, what will be some of the, um, uh, how would you fix it? What would be some of the things that you would do to kind of 
fix this issue. I, and and I know that you know money is a big thing and it's something that we sometimes lack. So how would you go about fixing that without you know being able to pay these people what they you know would want? You know, if they go to bigger city, bigger county. Absolutely. First of all, I think that an attorney that will come to the valley will for, will immediately feel that community bond that they have. So personally, as a person, as a parent, or as, if they're a single person, they're going to know that it's a safe place. It's very homey. That's going to attract them. And that has nothing to do with the DA's office. That's just who we are, right? We are a welcoming community. Secondly, if we make the office of the district attorney feel welcome, if we have a good relationship, in a relationship where maybe I'm not getting paid enough in San Diego, but you know what? I don't have to drive two hours to get from one court to the other. And I remember saying people, when I first got here from LA, they would say, oh man, I got to go to Brawley. That's so far away. And for me, it was really? Well, now it's like, oh man, I got to go to Brawley. And, and, but you know, that, that's a blessing. It's 15 miles. It's 20 minutes. You're not in your car wasting hours. You have quality time with your family. If you want to go to the beach, you go to San Diego, you go to Yuma, et cetera. This is a prime location to establish your home. Now, if we can make the office an inviting environment where everybody works together, where there are opportunities for career. Maybe you're not getting paid enough as in San Diego, Riverside, et cetera, but you want to be at work. You want to stay here. You want to make your career here. That's where I'm going to work very hard to make the employees have a very good relationship. Myself as a DA will have an opening, uh, an open door policy. And then obviously we have to look out for the families, each individual, establish a working relationship with the board of supervisors to see what funding we can get aside from the board of supervisors let's look for grants let's 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 see what the state what the federal government has to offer what programs we can uh, obtain so that we can recompense our employees uh for the hard work that they do yeah for sure um we you know we're in the Pearl county we're uh really um what was the word I was looking for? It's different because we're a border town, border county. Um, how important do you think it is to the DA's office to have a good relationship with not only the local police departments, the sheriff's office, the highway patrol, but you know we have uh, customs and border patrol. How important is it to have a good communication with everybody, even people from across the border? It is extremely important to establish a forged relationship with our law enforcement uh, community, not only, as you said, municipal, county, state, federal, but as well internationally. Why is that? Because we in the county, we are going to prosecute drug cases. Many of those drug cases have dual jurisdiction, federal and state. It's good to work. It's, it's necessary to work hand in hand with the federal government and establish a memorandum of understanding. Okay, you will take these drug cases. If you don't, you know, we're aware of what we're going to prosecute. Maybe we can work and hide a um, high intensity drug trafficking activity uh, uh, monies that we can get from the federal government. That's why there's a lot of resources that we have to be active for to suppress crime and also to benefit our community. Now, internationally, it's extremely important to have good relationships with law enforcement across, uh, across the border. Why is that? Because we want to make sure that our children are safe when they're in Mexico, when they are out there. Think about it. You said it's a border town. How many times do kids go to Mexicali to like I was or whatever it is because they can drink and they're 18, they're 20, whatever it is. We want to make sure that our kids can come back safe home, right? We want to have that, that relationship. Listen, you know, if, if you see these kids getting in trouble, Comandante, you call my lieutenant here, kind of like a high school resource officer. Let's start that program. It protects not only Mexico, it protects us as well and, and, and our juveniles. So it, it benefits both of us. Whatever crime occurs in Mexico is going to pour over into the United States. It benefits both of us to have a strong, transparent relationship. And I am the position to do that. Um, how important do you think it is um, for somebody like, say, um, uh, uh, Mr. Otero that's leaving and the new uh, whoever gets a new position, how important it is for them to, you know, keep a line of communication to kind of like um, make sure that, you know, they, they, they know what, how, how things were ran before and 
how do you know that 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 smooth transition of, of kind of like new position? It's extremely important to have a smooth transition. And knowing Mr. Otero, I know that whomever has the privilege and the honor of becoming the next DA, Mr. Otero will be there to help them, to introduce them to how things work now. And then the new DA, which will be me, will then take, you know, follow in the footsteps and uh, go ahead and uh, take other measures to, to bring more benefits to the county. Um, I was reading, like I said, I was reading the article to, from the Collective Chronicle, um, and you mentioned uh, that you want to help out veterans. Um, yes. What are some of the things that you've seen here in the Valley that, you know, that have been done to our veterans that you would like to change? Um, obviously, without disclosing names, it's an ethical thing, but veterans have come across uh, my practice that have had clean records, but they serve our country passionately dedicated. They come back with post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, you know, stress syndrome, other issues, perhaps even drugs, because we don't have the resources to identify, to help them cope with those issues. Many of the actions that result are either domestic violence, driving under the influence. And because we don't have an established veterans court, they're treated as a DUI uh, defendant as a domestic violence defendant. And I'm not saying let's be easy on crime. Absolutely not. My job is to enforce the laws, not to make the laws. That's the legislature. The legislature has created laws for the benefit of veterans, for mental health, for judicial diversion, an array of, of, of areas where we are seeking rehabilitation for those that, you know, that deserve it, for those that are going to be amenable to the program. Many people may think that's going easy on crime. It's not. We need to examine the root cause. We have our veterans coming back home. They are having you know, difficulties reintegrating into society and they make one mistake of driving under the influence or maybe an argument gets heated where, where violence is, is inappropriately used. That's going to tarnish their life once they get into the system, they are criminals. There are measures to address their needs, uh, whether it's mental health, et cetera, and that also helps the community because it promotes public safety. That's what I want to focus on. You can Google San Diego Veterans Courts, Riverside, et cetera, Los Angeles. I'm not going to compare our county to them because this is my county. This is my home. But I want our veterans and our citizens to have the same advantages, the same benefits that the law entitles them to. Okay. Um, I, I was, when I was watching the live stream, um, you mentioned something, and even in the article, um, that kind of I, I, somebody somebody made, said made a comment because I guess they, they were a little bit triggered. Um, you mentioned that uh, that too often the needs of the offender are also overlooked, um, and and I, I mean I agree. There's times where um, people, I mean, a good example is a, a veteran where you know he commits a crime because of you know mental health or other issues they might be going through and they're judged, um, you know, really bad, badly. Um, and somebody, you know, some, some people might not like that. Um, but what, what can you say to that? What I can say is we can go ahead with that spirit of you do the crime, you do the time, you commit an offense, you go to prison, you go to jail, you do your time, you come out, you have not received treatment. We don't know what caused you to, to uh, commit this offense, whether it's a lack of uh, vocational uh, education, whether it's because you're dual diagnosis, whether you have a, a mental disease. And what's going to happen? You think, oh, I went to jail for six months. Now I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good to go. No, they're, they're going to escalate. It's going to be from a misdemeanor to a felony, which in the end, the community, the state is paying more money because you are locking people up without getting addressing their needs. And the crime is just going to get more violent. I am not easy in crime. People that are not amenable and are not eligible because there is, there is quite a criteria for these programs, they are going to do the time and they're going to do hard time, especially if they've had a long criminal record, they've been given opportunities. That's not my position. My position is let's be hard on crime but let's be fair about it. Let's be fair in administering justice. If someone made a mistake, we can each think of a relative that made a boo-boo and a mistake that now, you know, 
they can become the law enforcement officer that they wanted to because they got a certain misdemeanor where, you know, they should have addressed the problem first. So that's my position. As yeah. Far as that. Yeah. Because, um, I feel like here in the, in the County, I mean, I see it all in Calexico where, you know, we're a lot of working class, lower class. Um, and I'm, I'm, I guess my question is, how do you, how do we keep a balance of, you know, making sure that, um, you know, we, we, you know, are in a way hard with the offenders, but at the same time, um, you know, not, not too hard because people are kind of tired of, you know, uh, especially I see downtown, downtown here in Calexico where, you know, a lot of the merchants are getting, you know, robbed or, or they're burglarized often. And it's because a lot of the people that are doing it are like, you know, oh, you know, I'll well, spend the night in county and I'll be back. And, you know, how, how do we make sure that, you know, people that feel unsafe, um, feel like they're being served, but at the same time, help the people that are committing to the crimes? You know, how do we keep that balance? That's a very good question. How do we maintain the balance? So you bring up a couple of very interesting issues. For example, as you indicated, somebody commits an offense, a, a burglary, uh, they're cited and released and they're gone. And then word spreads around the criminal element, if you will. Don't worry about it. They're just going to cite and release you. Or are you going to spend the night? What, what is that leading us to that? There's a disconnect between the sheriff's office and the district attorney's office. There has to be, again, that strong relationship between law enforcement agencies. And for example, maybe get, you know, one example is get a memorandum of understanding. If you can have somebody committing a, a, a property crime, commercial theft, et cetera, Mr. Sheriff, Madam Sheriff, look at the rap record. Let's agree on this. If, if they have a prior serious or a violent offense, don't cite and release them. Keep them there until they can post bail. Keep them out of the community. Um, obviously, now with the COVID, there's certain policies where they are classifying crimes. Unfortunately, that's outside of the district attorney's office. As I said, those cases will not get into the office until a report has been filed. But that's the way we do outreach. We do outreach with the, with the, um, with the community, with business owners. What are you worried about? What is happening in your district? Oh, you know what? Between these hours and that hours, my business is being broken into. Let's establish a relationship with the chief. Chief, can we maybe emphasize a little bit more patrol during these hours to bring down the, the, the thefts? And sheriff, if these people get arrested, can we maybe think of keeping them in custody until they get their arraignment and then they either post bail or they stay there until they're uh, sent to prison or jail because they no longer qualify? Rather than just crossing your arms and waiting for them to come to you, let's be proactive, not reactive. That's, I think, something that we can do. Yeah, and I feel like, uh, I mean, um, Calexico's, I don't know if the only the only city in the Valley that is really understaffed when it comes to police officers. And that's one of the main causes where um, the same places get burglarized because, I mean, you have two cops patrolling the whole city. Um, you know, you get distracted here. So, you know, obviously something's, something's uh, unsupervised. So, you know, that's one of uh, what I've seen here in Calexico. You know, there's a huge lack of, or it's really understaffed here in Calexico. How do we address that? Unfortunately, you are correct. Uh, law enforcement is understaffed, given the great expectations that we have of officers to protect us. But then again, we can't leave everything into the hands of law enforcement, community outreach. Let's start with some community uh, uh, programs where, Business owners, let's get together. Maybe, you know, we have a meeting once a week. We put some cameras out, put more lighting, uh, neighborhood watches. Let's promote that. So if the officers aren't out there alone risking their lives, we have community members helping out. Maybe, you know, not just calling 911, but having a, a direct line where they can say, look, there's a suspicious activity. It caught it here on camera, especially now with all of the technology. You can see what's going on. Then one officer can get there, or two officers and soon enough, this is going to be sufficient deterrence to bring down that crime element. We have to work together as a community, not leave everything to officers, to law enforcement. They can't do it all alone with the resources that they have. We need to help them. District Attorney's Office, as I said, as top cop, has to get out there, be proactive. And that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I see, I live here in Calexico. Um, and just like from social media or like the, the news or 
the newspaper. Um, I feel like Calexico is the one that's, you know, always in the news saying like we're under staff. And I hear, you know, police officers go to uh, city council meetings, you know, pleading the council to <clears throat> to her, uh, you know, speed up the process of hiring more officers. Um, and, and at the same time, I know it's hard to, you know, the hiring process is kind of hard when, you know, you might not like the, the 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 candidates, and you're trying to make the best move for for your PD for your department. So, I mean, it's it's a yeah, it's kind of like a, a really hard, you know, to keep that balance of uh, speeding up the process of hiring people, and at the same time making sure you're hiring the correct people for your for your city, especially here in Calexico. I mean, it's you know, even though the, the county is a border county, but Calexico is the one that's the closest to to the border so it's 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 you know we i know that our, our officers get busy a lot of the times at the border you know helping customs or, or border patrol with you know other things so and at the same time we do help we do receive help from border patrol and stuff like that so it's a you know help we help them they help us so it's symbiotic yes. <clears throat> yeah um so can you tell uh, the people where they can you know uh, follow you, follow your 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 campaign. Um, if they want to contact you, how do they get a hold of you? Absolutely, ja 4 dacom Capital J, capital A, spelled out F O R, capital D, capital A dot com. There's some information you can follow me. You can volunteer to walk. Any help will help me. And again, a vote for me is a vote for you because I am going to do everything <clears throat> that I can to help. Not only. The community, but law enforcement and our community resources. I'm going to tie us, you know, it, it, como dicen, la, la fuerza es la unión. We have to be together to have a stronger community. Yeah, and, and I'll put um, on the description of the, the podcast, I'll put uh, your website. Um, like you said, it's J for DA. Um, yes, sir. And so you're, you're not going to do any social media stuff, just your website? The website, and they are working on that right now. My campaign, I just, it's off the ground uh, a couple of weeks out. Uh, so it, it will be up. If, if they go to the website, they'll be linked. Okay, okay. Um, anything else? We've, we've been at it for half an hour, and I don't want to take a lot of your time. I know it's it's kind of late. Um, anything else that I didn't ask you that you would like to add to, to our conversation? I just want people to know I'm, I'm a simple guy. I am a country lawyer uh, and I want to do the best para el pueblo. Uh, you know, I, like I said, I am blessed to be from this valley because, the, you know, I am considering myself a valleyite. I will never leave the valley. I will stay here and I want to do the best that I can. Vote for me is a vote for you. Estoy aquí para el pueblo. I am here to help the community. And thank you for your time. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you uh, for, for, um, spending this time with me and talking about you know your campaign a little bit by yourself um like i said my, my goal especially when it comes to um election season is to have a conversation with the candidates and you know get the people to know you what your campaign is all about and um i kind of feel we, we did a good job today you know getting to know a little bit about you and and you know how you what you would do if if you would you know when when uh the da position um, so I want to thank you for spending this time. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, shout out to Eric Reyes who who reached out and, and gave me your contact info. Um, but yeah, um, thank you once again. Thank you everybody for listening or watching. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you so much.